Good morning, everybody. My name is Sonia Wong, and I'm a CPA and financial professional with QX Financial. And uh, prior to my um, career at QX Financial, I worked in uh, public accounting, I worked at a CPA, two CPA firms, and I also worked at um, Hilton Hotels and Disney. Uh, so I worked in the uh, Burbank, uh, the Burbank office, the headquarters there, and then I, then I moved down to um, uh, Orange County, and then I assisted the uh, folks in the Anaheim office. So, yeah, was a, was uh, able to work with a great group of people and uh, learned a lot. But um, you know, further along in my career, I just decided that I really should be helping individuals and small businesses because I feel that they're underserved. I mean, corporations have so many people at their disposal, so many accountants and attorneys at their disposal, but what about the rest of us? So that's why, um, you know, I'm here on this mission with QX Financial and, you know, we're trying to help the underserved um, segments of the population. And uh, yeah, I met Ben in 2018 and, uh, you know, just, found the, the right group of people and, and decided that, hey, I'm, I'm just going to plant roots at QX Financial and, um, you know, let, let's do our thing to help people. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, long-term care, long-term care uh, planning options. And uh, it's going to be a two-part presentation. Um, the first one will be this packet here, and then the second packet will be the other one. So. Um, so let's, let's open up this long-term care planning options packet. And I printed it double-sided and in color. So last night I ended up running out of toner cartridge and I had to run over to Staples and uh, print out this information for you. So um, according to the Administration for a Community Living, and that's an agency that was created by the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, over 70% of people over the age of 65 are going to need long-term care. Um, I don't know if you think that's a high number or a low number, but you know this is based on decades of study <coughs> that um, they arrived at this percentage. Sounds high to me. Personally. Sounds it sounds high, but yeah. well, you know that it came from uh, you know Department of Health and Human Services. Mm -hmm. So maybe take that with, with a grain of salt, but. Um, Can you determine, de define long-term care? Yeah. Sure. Uh, long-term care is, and you just led right into the next page. I, I don't know. <laughs> you get stats, but you yeah. Know, I mean, what is it? Yeah. So it's basically um, assistance or aid with um, activities, of daily living. Right? So how how long is long-term? That's my point. Oh, okay. Because so, everybody's going to need care. Right. Eventually, yeah. So, one hundred percent. Well, so it would be anything like over, well, anything over ninety days. Right? Okay. Anything over ninety yeah. days. Right. So, thank you for that question. So, as long yeah. As you pay, continue to pay your premiums. Right. <laughs> yeah, or or you could pay up your premiums, right? You you can uh, do single, but I don't want to get ahead of um, the information that I'm about to share with you. So, um, yeah, so basically long-term care is assistance or supervision with activities of daily living. They're commonly referred to as ADLs. Uh, and what are those activities of daily living? Well, it's, there are six of them. Uh, the first one being eating, dressing, bathing, transferring, toileting, and continence. So this may involve the use of skilled nursing, or unskilled uh, labor or a combination of the two. And uh, there's a misconception out there that long-term care is covered by Medicare and it's not. So yeah, once everyone gets on Medicare, they have a rude awakening. Uh, so next page. And you should so, mention so. the fact that there's a drastic shortage of, of workers mm -hmm. in that oh, yeah. space. Yeah. A drastic shortage. Yeah. yeah. And COVID just exacerbated it. Exactly. You, you had some uh, care workers leave or, yeah. you know, just, yeah, there's there's a very high attrition rate right well, now. And according to the American Association of Family Practitioners, this was a release this on Sunday, mm -hmm. 1.7 million 
primary care physicians have left the field in 2002 across the United States. Oh, wow. And they expect it to be close to 12 million in, in leaving the field over the next 10 years and not coming back in. Wow. How many are in the field? Not enough. Not yeah. enough, yeah. yeah. That, that sounds catastrophic. Yeah. Especially right. geriatric physicians. Yeah. So just think you have an increasing no. aging population and you have a decreasing uh, source of um, care providers. Right. And, so, and they're saying the big thing is doctors that are coming into the field now yeah. are avoiding family practice and getting specialties. Oh, uh -huh. which pay more. Or yes. becoming concierge positions, yeah. which are all cash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have one that just joined the uh, Orange Chamber of Commerce. She's a concierge physician. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, you pay me, I think she was charging something like $100 a month. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, based on the severity of your, you know, request, you can get to see her within 15 minutes to, you know, within two or three days. Two or three days. So you pay her a retainer? You know, pay her monthly fee. Yeah. Uh -huh. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so some of the uh, qualitative questions that people should be asking themselves when they uh, plan for their long-term care is, um, you know, first of all, who's going to take care of me if something happens to me, right? If, if I um, suffer from some type of illness um, or injury or disability, who would that be? Um, and can my spouse or other caregiver uh, take time off of their schedule to take care of me? And um, you know, if that person is, um, you know, working, can they financially or physically um, take care of me? Is that something that's a possibility? And we're not talking about, um, you know, just whether someone can take care of us. Let's think about what the effects are, what the ger generational and intergenerational effects are. Is anyone else depending on me? Does a grandchild or a child depend on me still? You know. Um, you know, a few people may have some special needs uh, loved ones that they need to take care of. What's going to happen with them? Right? You need to provide for them as well. And uh, lastly, how am I going to pay for my long-term care? So, yeah, ne next page. So the ways that we can prepare for these needs are you can, one, you can self-fund or two, you can use the traditional long-term care uh, solution. Um, or three, you can use what is called asset-based long-term care insurance. And that involves the use of like a whole life uh, insurance policy that has cash value accumulation. Or um, you can link it to an annuity contract. And those things are known as um, hybrid long-term care insurance. Yeah, I have one of those. Oh, good, okay. I've got the regular one. Okay, yeah, so, um, you know, it would be good to review your policy, yeah. you know, every other year, just to make sure it still meets your needs. Yeah. So let's, let's uh, explore that first method of self-funding. Um, this means that your plans would use these assets uh, for lifestyle or legacy, right? And it could change drastically because of things like um, market volatility, right, or change in tax loss. And um, in order to fund the cost, you would have to liquidate your assets, right? Your savings in order to pay for your care. Um, so we don't, so let's move on to the second option, which is traditional long-term care insurance, right? This is nicknamed the use it or lose it option. And I always think of it as like car insurance, yeah. right? You pay it. And right. it's like, if you don't get into an accident, great. Mm -hmm. But then where, you know, where did your money go? It's kind of gone, right? You incurred some opportunity costs as well. But it's a requirement to have car insurance. So can I so. back up a second? Yeah, absolutely. Under, under the self-funding option, bullet yeah. point number two, is this where someone could take out a reverse mortgage on a home they own free and clear they live in? And use those funds to self self fund a plan. They could, yeah. Okay. They could use that. So that's a really good question. Okay. In fact, uh, I was going to have Yolanda jump in real quick about that. You know where they could tap into uh, mm -hmm. the, the equity of their home. Mm -hmm. So the funds you would put into like an annuity, or well, uh, that you would take out. In the, yeah. So Greg was saying, um, 
Yeah, I, I think you were uh, mentioning option one, right? Where you yeah. could tap into your equity and you could fund your uh, long-term care that way, or or some people may use it to self-fund, but it may be better off for people to um, use it to um, fund a. Well, policy. I know humans when they self-fund themselves. <laughs> Woohoo! Let's go yeah, party. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they don't think about you know when when the S hits the fan, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but so. yeah, because though, so what you're saying is, if we use a reverse mortgage on doing this, they've got a bulk of cash to do something with. Yep. And then, what do you do with that cash? And that's where you're going with number two. Uh, yeah, or, actually, or number three? two is has been out there for a while. That's okay. a solution that has been out there for a while. So that's why I was mentioning you use that bulk of cash to buy an you, annuity. Yeah. You, yeah. Which, okay. Which would go. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. you know, there are different options. Um, okay. Yeah, people can choose to do option two if they wanted to. Okay. Um, and then there's option three, which, uh, you know, is gaining some recognition. Um, and that is uh, what is called asset-based long-term care solutions. So, again, it's a hybrid solution where you've got either um, a life insurance policy is tethered to a life insurance policy or an annuity contract. Yeah, I have one of those from Prudential. It's a hybrid. Okay. Three hundred thousand dollars universal whole life or three hundred thousand dollars long term care. And okay. it's I got it when I just before I turned sixty. Okay. And I've been paying seven hundred dollars a month since. Okay. And is it um like they just say it's level or something like that? So what? Is it level? Uh, it won't increase $700? Yeah, no, the, the $700 okay. is an increase, and then my cash cash out value and the good. universal whole life just keeps increasing. Nice. But. Okay. Good. Yeah, so so Lou has uh, some experience with that. Well, good, good for you. Um, so with this particular solution, if you don't need to tap into the long-term care benefit, mm -hmm. you can actually um, get a return of the premium uh, and you know, if you don't use it and you pass away, you can pass these uh, pass this asset over to your beneficiaries right. in the form of a death benefit. Yeah, yeah that's in my trust. Yeah, and so um, it, in some cases, you may be able to take a loan against the cash value of the policy too. So, going to the next page, um, you know, let's let's take a look at an example of how. Um, you know how the funding would look un in those three different scenarios. Let's say that um, the healthcare costs, the long-term healthcare costs, came to about seven hundred sixty-five thousand nine hundred seventy-nine dollars. Uh, so if you were to self-fund, of course you would have to self-fund the entire seven hundred sixty-five thousand nine seventy-nine. But if you had um, a traditional long-term care policy, right, um, you'd be paying. Uh, you know, out-of-pocket expenses of $256,765. And this is just an example, right? Everyone's situation will be a, a little different. Um, and then the third is asset-based long-term care, right? The hybrid one is, uh, you'll find that it's just slight, the out-of-pocket expenses are just slightly under the traditional uh, long-term care policy. And then there's a death benefit. So if you were to, chart that on a bar graph and that's on the next page so i have a question yeah the 765 979 mm -hmm. health cost how was that derived for the for the sample oh, okay um they took a look at um a 65 year old so you know this is just an example an example right um of course expenses for a 60 year old or a 55 year old or a 75 year old will look differently and this is this is just to measure right. you know the comparison or take a comparison and did that does that seven hundred thousand plus assume increases inflationary increases into the long term care costs or is it just based at at this age they're going to live to this point yeah it is it is basically um a blend of those different factors like uh, inflation right because there are there is an inflation rider with some of those uh, two solutions yeah, so. on the bar chart it's uh, starting starting at age 65 correct yeah and so moving out from there and then how far down the road are we at 257,000 uh, well this is assuming that the policy is fully funded right you know that you they either pay um, single premium or they pay over the course of 10 years 
Okay. So, so I've had mine for 10 years, so okay. am I fully funded? I have to take a look. Oh uh, yeah, we'd have to take a look at your policy yeah. just to see if... Depends on whether they're still sending you a bill or not. <laughs> they are. Yeah. 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 But that happens too. So what is the average cost of long-term care now, uh, per day? Oh, the average. Oh, in California. Yeah. Well, uh, I was gonna say by month. It, you know, on the low end, it's seven thousand dollars a month. Seven a month. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then um, average is about um, ten thousand for California, Whew. and it's higher for uh, Hawaii, like Massachusetts, New York. Yeah. So is my three hundred thousand dollars enough? Uh, you know, I mean, it depends on. How much your care is, or you know, would you be getting that care at home? And how even, long do you want to live? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I got to live until eighty-one just to, to make uh, break even on my collecting but, Social Security at seventy. So I got to live to at least eighty-one. So I got plans until then. That's another ten years. You got to put up with me. Greg's <laughs> like, don't. darn, they're like brothers. Yeah. So you know, you you can see just visually. Um, self-funding versus the other two methods. Um, so, wow. let's, yeah, let's go to the next page, which is uh, when the long-term care benefits are uh, activated. So, in order for those long-term care benefits to be activated, the policyholder must not be able to perform at least two of the six daily uh, activities six activities of daily living um, for at least 90 days. So, you know, again, those, those uh, six, you know, eating, bathing, dressing, transferring, toileting, and so you've got 90 days of taking care of yourself. Yeah. And then, then it kicks in. Yeah, then it kicks in. But you have to, when you first cannot do those two things, you have to start the clock and let them know that, yeah, right. hey, I know I'm not gonna be able to, or somebody, your caregiver, your, whoever you designate as a power of attorney, mm -hmm. have them notify um, mm. the claims department. Um, so yeah, the other, um, the other way that these benefits can be activated is if the policyholder is uh, diagnosed with um, cognitive, like severe cognitive impairment, you know, like Alzheimer's. And then, so let's get to the next page. I even have a gap policy oh, okay. that fills in between the time that my long-term oh, care kicks in and is supposed to fill in the gap. Right. Well, that, that's good because usually that's one of the toughest parts is like, oh, those 90 days. That's 118 tough. bucks a month. Yeah. Planning on you kicking off during the 90 days. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's important for us to uh, designate assets for specific purposes, mm -hmm. right? Where, hey, Make sure that you're keeping your retirement assets working, you know, growing so that you can fund your lifestyle, right? And then um, also you probably want to leave something to your beneficiaries or your kids or a charity. Um, and uh, also it's, it's important for you to have a plan in the first place and then review it every so often. Right? So don't wait longer than five years to review your plan because of all the you know, changes in laws, right? You could be dealing with, you know, market volatility, like shocks, you know, systemic shocks. So, um, you know, some things that, that people, some people didn't know is that uh, depending on your tax situation, you may be able to uh, deduct your long-term care premium, insurance premiums, right? Uh, there's, I have a chart for, for you. Um, it's in the packet of information, um, 2023, uh, deduction limits so uh, and then whatever again whatever unused long-term care benefits uh, that are left over from your asset-based long-term care policy can be used as a tax-free uh, death benefit so if you ever want to take a look at the studies that uh, the Department of Health and Human Services did um, to determine you know to provide us with these uh, statistics you can go to that um, QR code you can scan that QR code or um, yeah go Google LTSS and you'll be able to get a lot of great information so these are just ideas for you to go over with your um, you know financial advisor your CPA your great. tax person yeah, so 
now let's get to the second set of uh, slides, right? And this is where, you know, there's some solutions. Um, and it's as good as the first. This is very, <laughs> yeah, very good. good yeah, Thank you. I kidding. appreciate that. Yeah, so, um, you know, there, there's a silver lining. We, we can use uh, long-term care solutions it is as... A silver lining? Huh? Rather than a silver bullet? <laughs> rather than silver sneakers? Hey, pick, pick, your, uh, pick your poison, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah we so. live in California, so we're used to it. Yeah, we're, right. we're, we're immune to the poison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, you know, you, you know, I'm just going to go over uh, how people can use long-term care solutions to uh, optimize their income and preserve their retirement assets. So, uh, you know, there are many risks that retirees face, but the main ones are things like the market risk, right, tax risk, and then longevity risk. Right? We don't know how long we're going to live, um, and, and so we want to make sure that we don't outlive our money at the very least. Um, so, what the financial experts have I'm come okay up with? I'm outliving my money. <laughs> Uh, because I'd you're be a low to. maintenance person. That's right. Yeah, good good for you. I know many people who are not. <laughs> I just have this cup already set up with pencils and I'm ready. Nice. Yeah. Okay. More people should learn from you. So um, <laughs> yeah. the financial experts uh, come to like a general consensus as to what the safe withdrawal rate is. And uh, just in case you don't know what the safe withdrawal, what that means is that is the uh, annual rate at which you should be withdrawing from your retirement assets uh, without draining it, right, before you pass away. And so uh, the consensus is that the safe withdrawal rate should be 3.3%. Two years ago, it was 4%. <laughs> so now they had to, now the experts had to reduce it, right, based on inflation, based on market based on you know i, I don't taxes. quite understand what that what that means oh the safe withdrawal rate yeah so um you know that's the annual rate that you should it's like a rule of thumb that you should use to uh, withdraw from your retirement assets okay and if you're not retired that doesn't apply to you exactly it doesn't this re, this applies to the retirees so you're saying someone has a million dollars in in assets yes. and then they start re withdrawing uh, Thirty-three thousand dollars a year out of that million would be a safe number yeah. to to coexist or to live or yes. sustain themselves upon. Yeah, because it should generate thirty-three thousand a year, approximately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it maintains the same. Right. Yeah. So. But as we know, <laughs> uh, that's that, that, yeah, it's not. <laughs> that's in an ideal world, right? That you would generate at least three percent. But I have a defined benefit pension. So I don't have to withdraw, I just get monthly pension yeah, exactly. payments. Yeah, exactly. That would be different now, because yeah. a lot of people have put their money- It doesn't have a max either, does it? No, it just keeps paying me yeah. as long as, as I long live. as long as you yeah. live, yeah. 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 yeah, so the people who really have to worry are the people with you know, 401ks, mm -hmm. like 403bs, right? They need to make sure they don't drain it all. That's why the state doesn't offer a defined benefit <laughs> exactly. pension anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And it's nice they pay for my health care too. Yeah. So, so that's so a big great. that's a big weight off my shoulders. And the other thing is that is I I've helped people that have uh, self directed IRAs and they've bought real estate and put it in there. Sure. They're they reach in the, the time where they have to start doing a drawdown. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken to two of these different handlers and they're saying they have to draw down seven percent every year. That's true. I mean is that is that just the plan itself, or is that what they? You know, yeah, what it's they a sign? requirement. You know, with all the uh, tax regulate the um, internal revenue codes and everything like that. But um, with the four hundred one ks and other types of uh, qualified accounts, right? That's kind of like the rule of thumb. IRAs are that way too. Didn't they yeah. just change the regulations on the drawdown? Oh, they will change the age, right? They change the age at which you can uh, start, like the required minimum distribution age. Um, yeah. So for 2023, they uh, bumped the um, required minimum distribution age to 73. It used to be 72. Like it changed within, um, like from 2020 to 2022, it went from 70 and a half to 72. Mm -hmm. And then this year, 
It's 73. And and what's the percent that you have to take out or minimum you have to take uh, it, out? It depends on um, like the mortality tables they use for... Um, actuary? Yeah, the actuary. Uh, yeah, exactly. The actuary okay. tables. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, right now that's that's it. If you don't want to drain it to oblivion. I think last week he used uh, the term, if you don't want to drain your retirement assets into oblivion, <laughs> make arrangements for long-term care, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, people uh, think that cash flow and income are the same, but they're not always the same. And uh, Yolanda was going to speak today with me, um, but we were going to bring to your attention that cash flow from the reverse mortgages are not taxable. Okay. So, right. um, and then same thing with distributions uh, via loans from your whole life cash value policy, cash value insurance policies. Those are generally tax free. And then benefits from uh, your long term care insurance are generally tax free as well. So, so if you go to the next slide, you know, let's put ourselves in the place of a retiree um, who started their retirement at, in, in 1965. Okay. Let's say he or she started with a million dollars, and we're gonna look at the, um, you know, just take a look at the solid gray line. And, um, you know, you know that from 1965 to 1990, we've, we've seen recessions and market downturns. Um, and if I was a retiree with just a 401k or some, you know, something like that, or some other assets that would be taxable, and I took distributions during all those years, I'm whittling down my principal, right? I'm no longer able to earn any um, interest, dividends, or income on that principal. So what if I could afford to wait out some years, right? What if I was able to take um, like a reverse mortgage or take distributions from my whole life policy? Um, now, if I took all my distributions without the help of those buffer assets, um, I would be out of money by 1995. Just saying, I retired in 1965, and if I took all my distributions during all those severe up and down shocks to the market, I would run out of money by 1995. I I would probably get my Social Security, but that's you know that's as much as I'm going to get. Oh, that's good for a double wide refrigerator box under the freeway <laughs> overpass. Yeah, the Social Security. Yeah. Yeah, I know it doesn't. It, even though they adjust Social Security for inflation, they couldn't adjust it fast enough. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so, in a best case scenario, if we could um, wait it out, right? Wait it out, not touch our investments or our retirement assets. At least it would allow those assets to those investments to grow. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's how you're able to preserve your. Um, you know, your retirement assets through the use of buffer assets like um, reverse mortgages, um, whole life insurance policies, and long-term care solutions. Yeah. Question. Yes. The second graph? I yeah. Know, are, you, are we at the second graph? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh -huh. The thick line says it skips 67, 70. Does it just mean they don't take withdrawals in those exactly. years? Exactly. Yeah. And is it because of like the advice of the finance, like it's not a favorable year to get the yeah, withdrawal it, or it, what? Yeah. Either, either they know or they talk to their advisors okay. and the advisors saying, hey, you know what, give your investments a chance to grow. Do you have another okay. bucket or pot of money that you can draw on for your um, basic living needs? Yeah. Sure, I'll go live with my children. Yes, <laughs> or your grandkid, right, when she oh, starts God. with. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, this is the solid gray line. That would be a best case scenario. Um, and you know this is all pre-tax okay these two graphs just show what would happen right if you left those assets alone um and that's before tax so let's let's get to the next juicy one I which have is to leave my tax payment alone too. <laughs> yeah the the next thing is how do we solve for taxes right we you know um, and there are three different buckets and we'll go over um, what those buckets are but the way um, traditional asset investments like 401ks um, and IRAs, traditional IRAs are set up, is that people taking distributions from those accounts have to pay taxes. 
at rates that are prevailing at the time of distribution. Okay, so right now we're in a very, um, believe it or not, low tax rate environment. So if you think tax rates are high now, um, <laughs> you know, guess what they will probably be in the future, just based on our $31 trillion deficit. You know, someone's got to foot the bill, right? World War II through the early 60s, it was the, the top, top category was 90%. Yep. Taxes. Yeah. So you make a hundred thousand, you keep ten, and give ninety to the government. Yeah, and, and that's why Ronald Reagan—he uh, was supposed to do three movies. I think he ended up doing two because he didn't want to pay more than he needed to to the IRS or the state of California. I Don't think forget. it was actually Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, that reduced the high, the highest rate, yeah. and uh, made some tax cuts to stimulate the economy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so good so, point. And the tax liabilities due on the amount taken at distribution, not right. on the whole amount. Exactly. Mm, right. Yeah. Okay. Whatever you took, in, okay. right. whatever we take in distributions, we have to pay taxes on that uh, that amount. Right. So you know, so what we want to do is we want to find a way to um, you know protect our money in a tax-free way. You pay taxes on Social Security too, don't you? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so it I depends mean. on what your modified uh, adjusted gross income yeah. comes to. So, so yeah, so let's go over those three different buckets. Um, the first one being the tax now bucket. We all know what those are, um, you know, just things oh, like yeah. brokerage and stock. Just, oh, yeah. yeah, that's where uh, a lot of people keep their money. And um, then the next bucket is the tax deferred bucket, right? So those are things like the 401k uh, for govern employ government employees, their TSPs. Um, and then 403Bs and then, um, You could add deferred sales trust to uh, tax deferred, couldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. What's TSP stand for? Oh, it's the thrift savings plan that federal employees have. It's, it's, it's called a thrift savings plan. Thrift savings. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and so the last bucket is the tax free bucket and a uh, you know, we, come, we also refer to those as buffer assets. Okay. So what falls in those, in that buffer assets bucket is, are things like your Roth IRAs, um, your TFRA, which is the uh, cash value whole life policies. Cash right? value? Yeah, cash value whole life policies. Cash value life policies. Yeah. Cash value whole life. Huh? Yeah. And then... What does RA stand for? Um, the retirement, act, yeah, tax-free retirement account yeah tax-free retirement account um and then the third one is the heckam right which is the reverse mortgage right mm -hmm. and i'm just going to talk about that and then um long-term care insurance benefits right because when you take the when you uh use the benefits they're not included included in your income yeah. so some people have a tax bliss period Okay, those are the people who are age 59 and a half to 73. Um, what is the significance of 59 and a half, age 59 and a half? That's the um, first age, or that's the age at which you can start taking money from your um, Roth IRA and your 401k, yeah. And then 73, well, you know, it's the updated age for required minimum distributions. But uh, you can't take Social Security before 62, is that correct? That's, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. So if you can start slowly moving money out of the tax now and the tax deferred buckets into a tax free bucket, at least you can diversify your tax risk, right? Manage your tax risk so that not all of it is, you know, vulnerable or, or exposed to uh, taxation. Mm. And um, you, you remember me mentioning that uh, Medicare doesn't cover long term care needs. Um, you know, people seem to think that Medicare Part B covers that, but it, it actually just covers, um, you know, doctor uh, and healthcare provider services, right? Outpatient care, right? And the other thing that Part B covers is also um, like durable medical equipment, right? And then home health care, like very limited home health care, um, and then maybe some preventative services. But they're not going to cover assistance for activities of daily living. But does it cover the doctor visiting you in the, in the uh, assisted living home or in the nursing home? Uh, to a certain extent. Okay. There is a, a limit 
and, yeah, and a cap, but yeah, but that, it will cover a portion of that. And the other thing to know about um, Medicare is that the more, uh, the higher your income is, um, and I'm talking about modified adjusted gross income, you'll have to pay an additional um, premium amount for mm -hmm. Medicare Part B, ouch, right? And then um, also that increases for the um, Medicare prescription uh, drug coverage as well. Yeah, it's nicknamed the income related monthly adjustment amount. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, something that most people don't know is that depending on our tax situation, we may be able to deduct our long-term care insurance premiums, right? That's the amount that you can deduct. It depends on what age, in what age band you fall under. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't need to repeat myself with the uh, unused long-term care benefits. Um, those are tax-free to your beneficiaries as well. Um, and then here's the, here's the chart um, of deductible limits, right, based on the age bands. Um, I gave, I'm giving you the 2023 limits as well as the 2022 limits. If you're, you know, still in the middle of filing your taxes, you may be able to take advantage of this. Um, and you can, you can actually take the deduction if you itemize your deductions. If you take the standard deduction, it's not, you know, eligible for deduction. Um, and it has to, it has to exceed that 7.5% uh, AGI threshold, uh, adjusted gross income threshold. Yeah. So on my 22 taxes, I could take uh, 5960. You could take, uh, yeah, for 2023. For 2022, you can take 5600 Yeah, and then 23 would be assumably higher than that. Yes, yeah, that's the And that, that's the annual premium for the, for the, for oh, the insurance. Oh, I see. I got you. Yeah. I, I got you. Yeah. I, I okay. see. The annual, that number is what would an annual premium would be? Uh, not necessarily. It's just the limit. This is the limit. Because your okay. premium might be more, right? Okay. But this is the maximum you can deduct for okay. the age limit. All right. Um, so good question deducting you're deducting what the premium uh like a portion of the premium the the long-term care because my prudential keeps telling me that I'm, i can't deduct any of it right because it's probably um a 101 g it, it falls under 101 g <laughs> internal revenue code 101 g if it falls under internal revenue code 7702 b you can deduct a portion of that. we'll give you a copy of this <laughs> <laughs> of this program here. yeah but that's a, that's a great point that you mentioned because most people think oh, okay i have an iul uh, yeah. an index universal life policy with a chronic illness rider i should be able to deduct that yeah, no. every year i ask my prudential the person that sold it to me and she says nope same answer yeah no deductibility <laughs> right huh. i go gee 700 bucks a month that's 8400 dollars a year mm -hmm. and i can't deduct any of it Hey, ask her to find something else for you, or, you know, like we, we can find something, we can maybe look for something for you, so, so it, it doesn't hurt to ask. For both of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this is per person, correct? Exactly, it's per person. So, so if you're married, if you're married you, you, you can you double, you double that. that. Yeah, you can, yeah. You can double, you double the deduction? Yeah. Uh, it depends on what age she's at. Is she also 70? She's way older. 30, 39. Oh, okay. She's 39. Yeah, so, so both of you could theoretically take a maximum, each of you yeah. could take a maximum of yeah. 59, 60 for 2023. I just went through my taxes with my accountant yesterday, so yeah. I better give her a call. Yeah, give her a call. See, um, and then also talk to your agent Yeah. to, to find out which internal revenue code that policy uh, is under. Well, it's, it's, like I said, it's at least 10 years old. Okay. So... Would, the would, that, would that even apply? Uh, yeah, I mean, the agent should be able to know like which internal revenue code that it falls under. Okay. Well, they're proposing a new, uh, IRS is proposing a new uh, tax form, very simple, just two boxes. Mm -hmm. How much did you make last year? And the next one says, send it to us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On December 29th uh, of last year, the SECURE 2.0 Act was passed, and there was a provision in there related to um, long-term care insurance funding is uh, if somebody's still under the age of uh, 59 and a half 
they could take up to $2,500 in distributions from their um, 401k to pay for long-term care insurance premiums without being subject to the 10% early withdrawal penalty. Okay, but they're still gonna be taxed on the distribution. I mean, I think that's kind of a small price to pay. Is that only only for health related? Uh, this is for the long-term care pre uh, insurance premiums. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's that's one nugget that I was able to find in the Secure 2.0 Act. There are a few other ones. Um, so, how can you protect yourself and your loved ones? Well, you, you want to get all all your um, you know advocates on the same page, right? You want to get them ideally um you know have them meet in the same page you know get them into a meeting and then talk about what your wishes are and then uh draft a plan right and if, if you need to implement any tools into um you know just activating that plan yeah do it as soon as you can while you're still healthy right and co coherent <laughs> <laughs> and then you want to revisit your plan at least every three years, right? And don't wait, don't wait longer than five years. I actually um, work with somebody who put together a plan, and it was like ten years old, ten to twenty years old. Yeah. So the other thing is California, um, California, uh, the California legislature uh, passed. Um, Assembly Bill 567 about four years ago. And it was to put together a task force to conduct um, an actuarial study uh, to, to see the feasibility of setting up a state long-term care program. And um, they are the findings are due to the governor on January 1st, 2024. Um, you know, the reason why they had to do this is because, well, long-term care um, is going to be a very big issue, especially with more and more people um, retiring and needing uh, long-term care services. So uh, the first guinea pig uh, to start a state long-term care program was the state of Washington. Um, what they did was in 2021, they started to implement a 0.58% uh, payroll tax for people who work in Washington, the state of Washington. They don't necessarily have to reside in the state of Washington, but they have to pay that uh, payroll tax. Now the problem is that um, the benefits were only available to the residents. So then um, there's some lawsuits um, against the state of Washington for, for that. Um, so um, hopefully they'll get that fixed soon. Um, but that's coming down the pike. Yes. I'm a member of RPEA. Okay. Retired Public Employees Association. Okay. And CalPERS offered a long-term care plan, which was terribly flawed. Mm -hmm. And there's been nothing but lawsuits ever yes. since. I mean, and that's what we discuss almost every time we get together every quarter is the progress of the lawsuit against yeah. CalPERS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and um, two years ago, yeah, I think it was about two years ago, the uh, plaintiffs actually, they were on the verge of winning that lawsuit, but then um, CalPERS was able to walk away based on a technicality. Yeah, yeah it was... Well, it's, the lawsuit's been reinstated and they're, okay. they're, they're back suing each other. Yeah, so I do know one, pers one person who is still using the long-term care, she's about 80 and, um, y you know... It's a, it's a terrible system. Yeah, so... You know, Hopefully. I remember when they offered it to me, I had my uh, accountant look at it mm -hmm. and looked like, no. Yeah, that was a very smart accountant, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, these are just ideas. Right? You, of course, you'll want to consult with your uh, tax person, your financial advisor, your agent, get them all on the same page mm -hmm. together and make sure that your plan is, you know, pretty solid. So uh, that's all I have. For you guys at this point. Okay, and the rates, do, how do they relate to age when you start? The, In other words, if you start later, are they lower or are they higher or higher? Yeah, um, the what monthly, do you mean by the monthly rate? cost? Okay. Oh, the premiums? The yeah, the premiums. Oh, okay. Yeah, the premiums are, it depends on what 
you know, how old you are. That's what I'm saying. Right? Yeah, how old you are at, how at the time that you apply. If you're, if you're, at so the time if you're that older, you is it less or is it more? More. Well, yeah, it would be more. It's more. Why? It's because it's short, shorter time. Right, because, because you're so close to not having paid enough into them to start making money yep, on so you your have to put in more. when you start getting the services. Yeah. It, but exactly. the services aren't going to go as long because you're, you're, you're older. Not necessarily. Right, but the yeah. risk is that you'll need them pretty soon. Sure right? you, sure. who's, the likelihood of you needing those services yeah. um, is much higher. Uh, and plus, I'm sure that there is um, more care involved too. Balancing everything out, it, it's like the time span, right? The, if you have a longer time span, it's kind of like yeah. saving it's and investing too. Savings too. Yeah. Right? If you put in earlier at well, 25, yeah. it'll grow more. If it's, if they, it's correct. They yeah. Save if it's a payable money. one, yeah. But it's it's kind of like it's kind of like uh, whole life in in that respect. I mean, uh, in other words, the earlier got, everyone got. starts, the better. Yeah. Do you guys, as financial planners, recommend that people do a, a, like a, a HELOC just so they can be sitting there ready, just in case kind of thing? Well, I'm it, just curious. it depends. I mean, everyone's situation is different. Um, you know, everyone's situation is different. I mean, you like, need the money, they're not going to give it to you. I mean, they kind of, you know, somehow they know all the time if you're sick or if you're an employee or whatever. And then they can start the cards off and when you need the money. Yeah, you know, so the time to, you know, the time to do it is when you don't need it, right? Get all the stuff set yeah. in place when you don't need it, right? So that when you do, you know, at least you have another door you can walk through, right? So so a lot of these these plans that you mentioned is different ways to put this together. Mm -hmm. um, are the insurance policies do have some type of uh, health qualifiers or anything of that nature yes. and testing and that all that good stuff? Yes, um, for the hybrid care solutions, um, if it's tethered to like a life insurance policy, they are going to um, conduct like a telephone interview. Uh, and uh, they'll- With whom? Uh, with the uh, applicant. Okay. Yeah, so somebody from the pyramid company will call the applicant um, and ask them just basic questions, like what year is it, right? You know, it's nothing to be afraid of. It's just like who's who's the president? Who's you know, um, just basic well, that, questions. Well, that sounds like a cognitive test more than anything. Yeah, else. they're gonna yeah. they're conducting cognitive tests, and then um, depending on how fast or how cooperative the doctor's office is in releasing the uh, medical records, you know, the underwriting can process the application very quickly, even faster than a regular uh, whole life insurance <coughs> application. Yeah, so, um, so, so yeah. the possibility of someone taking out one of these policies based on the responses gotten back from medical professionals and answers to the consumer gives, mm -hmm. those that policy option could be denied. Yes, and I have seen people get denied. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are the premiums fixed or can they adjust the premiums as they wish down the road based on their payout experience? Uh, they're determined from the very beginning. You know, you determine the premium from the very beginning. Uh, they they're a fixed, fixed amount. Yeah. yeah, they're a fixed amount. Yeah. Really? Yeah. But they don't, they wouldn't go up, right? Who's the typical carrier for that? Uh, for the asset-based um, care solution, that uh, that's something that uh, One America specializes in. They held a patent for that particular uh, solution for up until two years ago. The patent expired two years ago. So Lincoln is also another one. Mm -hmm. How about John Hancock? Uh, not John Hancock, just Lincoln and uh, One America. Of course, I have John Hancock. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> here go, I'm um, <laughs> well, during, I, during, during the policy period, you know, most people get their policies canceled for non-payment, but is there a possibility during this that the, uh, the insurer reruns a medical cognitive test while the policy is in play? Nope. Okay, so you it's can. done at the beginning. Yes, yeah, done, done at the one, beginning. Done once. Done once. Okay. Yeah, done once. Um, as long as the applicant didn't lie on their application, then the insurer is held to, to their obligation. Nobody lies. <laughs> yeah, nobody. Um, but, uh, you, you know, this, I was going to say that the presentations record, so if you walked in, you know, midway, at least you can watch the recording. And, um, 
back when I was in my 30s, I got a, um, a universal whole life life insurance policy through Alexander Hamilton and um, I funded it for many years and then I was unemployed for a period of about six years and it kept funding itself until at the very end it said if you want to keep the policy now you do have to pay a premium because all the cash value is used up oh okay and, right yeah. <clears throat> yeah yeah that's a nice feature of those type of insurance policies. exactly yeah that, that is I mean um and you can attest to that, right? Because six years, you, oh. you can attest to that because yeah, through those six years, um, the insurance company was able to pay that premium for you. Right. So, yeah, uh, I mean, you, good choice. Good choice getting that in place when you were in, only in your 30s. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, does anyone else have any questions? I'm sure there'll great, be more later. Great presentation. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, awesome job. Very good. Uh,